to welcome all of you here. And just, I'm Barbara Shanko, the chair of the planning board. And just to quickly reiterate, one of the very important things that the zoning code and we who have to follow the zoning code try to do is to balance private property rights with the public good. And it's not always an easy task. And I remind you that as we look at different projects. So sometimes, even though we may feel a certain way, we have to follow the zoning code, and we also have to make that very important balance. Anyway, and you'll have a chance to speak tonight. So um, the minutes of the previous meeting, are there any corrections or additions? A motion, please. Motion to accept as, uh, as written. All in favor? We have some correspondence tonight. We have a memorandum for the code, from the code enforcement officer regarding 1151 Shore Road. We have a letter from M. Guthrie regarding the Moskowitz McMullen um, resource protection permit. We have a Department of Environmental Protection violation notice. Uh, we have a request to table to the June meeting the Bothell project. Is there anybody that has any objection to doing that? Okay, so tabled. We have a memorandum from the fire chief regarding Thompson Road, and we have a draft Trout Brook TDMD, TMDL summary fact sheet. Okay, our first item is a consent agenda, is there, which is uh, the high school dugouts. Is there anybody on the board that would prefer this not to be a consent agenda. Is there any discussion? I, I, I have a couple of questions. Or, um, well, let's see, is there anybody here who can answer any questions? Do you want to come up to the podium, please, and tell us who you are? Uh, my name is Samantha Perkins from Oaks Associates, and we've done the plans for the dugouts. Do you want to go ahead and, and then put that up since there yeah. are a couple of questions? Fairly minor, but um, okay. Um, one is um, the, uh, the you said somewhere in here that the uh, benches are going to be reused. The is current that, benches yeah, that are so they're going to be dismantled, taken taken away, and then set back. Are they set into the concrete, or are they? No, the benches that are out there now are just, I believe, wooden benches that are just, just setting out there on the yep. ground. Okay, and then. Um, a uh, dugout like this, what's the, um, you guys give any thought about vandalism? People breaking into the, the, the two locked areas? Um, um, and something like this, is that, um, the kids like to break into things like that and try to steal the equipment or? I mean, both the doors will all be locked and the windows, there's not going to be any glass or anything like that for anyone to break. It's just going to be um, the wooden panels that can be removed for games. So. Okay. I mean, as long as, as no one's tampering with the locks. Then. So those wooden, those wooden panels are, are locked? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Any 
And I'm just curious, what is on the plan to talk about concrete water table? What is that? Concrete water table? Yeah. Um, Did it say that on these plans or? Um, I think what they meant is that there's going to be a concrete slab that will be sitting above the water table. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's correct. Right. <laughs> okay. I'm good. Anybody else? Maureen, has there been any comment about this at all? Okay. Is that, is there anything else? We entertain a motion. Uh, I have a motion to be considered. He had ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted, the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth for an amendment to the previously approved site plan for the school campus located off Ocean House Road to construct dugouts at Pullman and Capano Fields be approved as a consent agenda item. Second. A second. All in favor? So moved. Thank you. Who seconded that? Please stand, Scott. All right, the Thompson Road Private Access Way Permit. Um, Madam Chair, is this, how would you like this oriented towards the audience a little more, or? Um, well, I think we need to be able to see it too. Rick, if you want to put it up on the, oh, up well. Up front here or to the left, maybe? How's that? Does that work for folks? I guess if the audience can't see it, they can move over to the other okay. side. Thank you. We have to be able to see it. Do the best I can to dance around it. Thank you. Thank you. All set. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, do you, before we have the public hearing, do you just want to briefly go over the changes that you've made to the plans, please? I'd be glad to, Madam Chair. Um, since the last submission, uh, we had made several minor changes to the plan. And pull this up. In our last, at our last submission, we had site walked up several weeks ago, about the one several weeks ago. Um, this again is Beach Bluff Terrace, Thompson Road Access Way, and Shore Road. This is the property in question. Uh, we did several things. Uh, we had had several meetings, uh, one preliminarily, one follow-up meeting uh, the day of the site walk, the regional street site walk to talk to the abutters, and to try and coordinate different levels of screening at the abutters properties, these first three properties uh, into here. Uh, following our site walk and our discussions with the abutters about where we'd like to put, where they'd like to have plants and shrubs placed, uh, we had a comment from Maureen that any shrubs or plantings ought to be on the very outside five feet of the Thompson Road right of way. So we submitted a drawing which adjusted plants that we had taken liberties because of where the lawns are within the right of way, moving the proposed plantings to within the outer five feet with the concept that, you know, if there was ever a right-of-way, that would, it's, it's not violating the intent of the right-of-way. Another change that we made on the, the, the last submission of plans, as you recall from the site walk, that we had discussed uh, with, with the fire chief, uh, uh, representative, to discuss getting rid of the key part of the turnaround, which we thought was 
very significant. It may be small in terms of looking at the project, but in terms of the, the abutters here, we thought that was very significant. So we don't have to have a paved surface here at the end of the turnaround, but instead we'll have a gravel surface with a grass uh, uh, top over it, which actually environmentally is a better situation. If you think about it, how often is a fire truck going to have to go there? Now you've got a gravel base that can support a truck uh, for turning around, and yet it's not going to every day be uh, you know, something you have to look at. So that will be a grass area for the gravel base. Um, and at the request of the abutters, we also removed, the original plan had proposed a combination, you recall, of fencing and vegetation along the buffer here. At the request of, I think, all unanimously of the abutters, we removed the fencing and, and simply are utilizing uh, shrubs and, and plants on the plan. And the other, uh, we added some minor information to the plan. We added the site distances as, as, as asked for on the plan that were indicated in the report. And uh, we've added, uh, at the request of Steve Harding, the town's engineer, uh, we have a small, it's a place in front here, we had an overflow drain which connects to a, uh, a small culvert here to help drain a small pocket of area. Those are essentially the pretty minor changes, but that was essentially the... Just the before we open the public hearing, can you briefly go over the size of the plantings and... The, how far apart they are just so that mm -hmm. the butters before they speak will then know what they're responding to. Thank you, Madam Chair. The plantings uh, we're talking about, and I'm going to have to just I'm going to pull up the actual landscape plan here, but in, in essence, the, the plantings that we're referring to are, again, we've got uh, a Hemlock and fir trees here. Hemlock, fir here. And no, no, no. no, I'm sorry. Fir, fir and spruce, I believe we have here. I'm yeah, sorry. And we have the flowering shrubs as we here. And again, we have 10, uh, 10 uh, fir and uh, hemlock trees faced through here. Another one here. And a mixture of forsythia. And the forsythia is through here. And specifically the sizes of those plants. We had talked to the butters, and this plan, was our landscaping plan, was prepared by uh, Tom Emery, who's a licensed landscape architect. And let me just make sure I've got the sizes correct on here. basically the same plan with the details shown on for the landscaping. And the, the plantings that we're proposing on the uh, white spruce and the hemlock are both six to eight feet. The balsam firs are six to seven. That's the plant stock as purchased from the nursery. And the uh, we have a Korean fir, the type of fir, six to seven feet. The lilac and uh, forsythia, and lilacs here in forsythia, are in the four to five and five to six respectively foot range. Again, those are all based on standard nursery stock sizes. Um, so again, the trees are essentially in the range of uh, five to six to seven feet, and the shrubs are in the range of four between the two, four to six feet. Thank you. Okay. Any other things that need to be clarified before we open the public hearing? We'll have a chance to ask questions later, but I thought that would be important for I just the public. make sure the plans that, that Rick is showing are the same plans we have. Well, yes. see, I had an old plan, and I just got the new plan from Maureen. The, the plans that Rick is showing you are almost exactly the same plans you have. The only difference is the planting plan you have shows new plantings in the middle of the Thompson Road right-of-way. And all of those plantings have been pushed okay. south. Right. So they're right on the edge. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. All right. We'll open the public hearing. Anybody who wishes to speak, please come and identify yourself first and then. I'm a little nervous because this plan is very different than the one I saw on Thursday. Um, my name is Lisa Manila. I live at 9 Beach Bluff with Hans Gunderson, and the new home is going to go directly behind us. And the last time we saw the plans, which was Thursday, um, the plantings were very different than they are right now. And um, it was our understanding at that time that Maureen had written a letter to the board requesting that the buffer 
plants be moved to within five feet of the Thompson Paper Road, and it was not our understanding that those five that it would be moved south. We thought that was open for discussion that the plantings could possibly be moved north. On the plan that you're looking at, the, the plantings by our home are behind a rock wall which existed when we bought our property. We understand it's part of the paper road, but it's significantly, um, it's just 15 feet have just been lost off of my yard in the last five minutes. I couldn't hear you say that last, I couldn't understand what you just said. Our yard just lost 15 feet in the last five minutes. So I would want to completely review the buffer plantings before anything was approved. Were they moved 15 feet or, or I know that there's the discussion about the planting spinning in the five foot right of way, what would be a right of way essentially? If you can look in the right of way, especially um, by the Cohen and Balzer lot and the Gunderson and Maynella lot, you see that the plantings were proposed in the center of the Thompson Road right of way. And what the applicant has done is responded to a comment that I made that uh, that's not the place to put anything since it's a right of way and that it should be moved either on private property or to no closer than five feet from the edge of the right of way, assuming that you could, you could put them on the very edge and still be able to put a road down the middle, which would be similar to the way Thompson Road is actually being constructed on the portion that is immediately abutting Shore Road. So the applicant has submitted a plan, which the planning board has not seen. They submitted it to me yesterday that has actually pulled those plantings all right to the edge, the southern edge of the Thompson Road right of way. That plan has not been submitted to the board. I believe the applicant submitted it in an effort to respond to a comment that I made. Um, but certainly, the board can do something else with that. So, Maureen, the plan can come out then, line right up with, with the other ones that were behind the Williams property, yes. right along the southern end. Yes. So they're a straight line down instead of being. Yes. Okay. Have the, have the number of plantings changed, or are they just all been moved? I believe they've just all been moved. The number is still the same. The size is still the same. And Mrs. Bynella just asked that they actually be moved north. Is that? Yeah, the, because the, the comment I made um, in the memo was that um, you shouldn't be putting them in the middle of the right of way. Yeah, and, I, I guess. And I had said you should put them on private property, or you could conceivably put them right on the very edge of the right of way. Within five feet. Within five feet of the edge. And I didn't say it had to go north or south or okay. where private property. I just made a recommendation of where it shouldn't go. Okay. I have a one copy of the uh, revised plan, and I can pass it around in case board members want to see it. I'll go. I'll go, I'll go to the right, I guess. <laughs> uh, can I ask a point of order? Just. Yes. You. During during a public hearing, are, are, is it possible for planning board members to ask the public for clarification when they're making comments? I, I, I certainly think so. Is that Maureen? Is that yeah. What you you want to avoid is getting into a debate. But certainly, questions that want to <laughs> probe the comments made by an applicant to make sure, by an abutter to make sure you understand what the point is is very appropriate. Okay. Thank you. To that point, can I just ask you a, a question? Your comment about losing 15 feet of your backyard, can you tell me what you mean, please? Um, I, I think it's an emotional loss because when we bought the house, we thought our property line, and we're told by our realtor it was in one place, so it's, it's our problem that we didn't survey the land. So I fully accept that. But I knew when we went on Thursday that Maureen was going to make a proposal that these properties, that these plantings were moved. Mm -hmm. But I thought there would be some discussion or we wouldn't just come here tonight and realize that all the plantings have been moved south. Mm -hmm. And the plantings are no longer sufficient if um, you're just going to move them south. We are going to need a bigger buffer if they're going to be right where they are. 
when, when you had come to our home and we had discussed this, you had thought that it would work to put places behind the rock wall, that that wouldn't be a problem. And I thought we had a, we had a nice, we had as, as nice of a conversation as it could have been. We were as open and honest with each other. We were saying that people don't like change. We don't like change. But you've bought the property. You have the right to do what you want. And that would make us as happy as possible, since a enormous home is going to be right in our backyard. So I'm just a little surprised to come here tonight and find that this was made. Well, I, I, I don't think any decision's been made. I okay. mean, that's one of the reasons we're asking the public to speak is because we want to try again to balance the needs of you and the needs of the, of the person right. who's going to be building the home on the property. So don't assume at this moment that anything's been decided. Nothing's been decided. You yep. state your case and you know, we keep notes and we come back to it. You're right. And it's very emotional now because... I know, I know that. Okay. Thank so you. For, for Thank clarification, you. it's your perception of your backyard that's lost 15 feet. But the property line has not moved. Well, um, yes, it's my perception. But also, had it gone behind the rock wall, or had the trees gone north instead of south, then Maureen had said it would be OK to keep the garden we've been working on for five years in the same place, as long as we allowed people to walk through it who wanted to access the Thompson Paper Road. And as long as we've been in the house, nobody has chosen to walk through our backyard to get anywhere in Beach Bluff. So we agreed that it would be OK for people to walk through the garden if they needed to walk through Thompson Paper Road for any reason. So we were thinking we could keep the garden, the rock wall, and have the buffer. And, but now the trees have been moved south. And the rock wall is in the middle of the right Thompson away. Paper Road. Right away. Right. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Anybody else who would like to speak? I'm Clara Cohan and I uh, live at 15 Beach Bluff, the third house in. Um, and we actually did lose two feet of our property because the post the, that has been in that ground for probably, I think, about 60 years, where that has always been the end of the property. And actually, when they did the new survey, there's a red ribbon on it. But we were informed that actually when they surveyed that, we, that it was actually two feet south of where that pin has been for a very long time. And when I just you know, measure it, you know, it comes out to 101 when I measure from the edge of the road to the, to the pin. So in a sense, we have, so that's sort of one issue. Uh, and also, um, I'm curious, now that they have changed the driveway, the turnaround in, does that change the drainage? Because from my understanding, when it was in its original form, there had to be some kind of drainage uh, that went uh, all along back here, all the way to here, basically. Um, and so I was wondering if that changed, because that would change how many trees they end up also taking down. Hi, I'm Ogden Williams. I live at uh, Five Beach Bluff Terrace. It's the house on the corner. Uh, I, I just wanted to point out, I guess my, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to interpret a map, but I, I guess I'll just speak, uh, just say what our concern, I mean, what we're, what we'd be worried about is, uh, and I think from talking to, the, to them, I mean, it seems like they're addressing this, but here's our house, and uh, we, we, our dining room is here, we eat dinner here, and so suddenly we have this, uh, basically a driveway pointing straight toward our house and I, I guess my my hope is and it's and that's the plan as i understand it is to have enough bushes planted here enough shrubs and trees so that we're not regularly going to be sitting in our house and seeing these lights come you know shooting on a regular basis uh, pointing right at us and 
uh, light after light, and we're sitting there watching these lights. And anyway, I'm just saying, I uh, my hope and expectation is that whatever shrubbery and trees are planted here are done in such a way so that it's that light shining straight at us is uh, not going to be very obvious and uh, disruptive. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm Wayne Daniels. I'm at 21 Beach Bluff Terrace, which is just beyond uh, the, uh, the, uh, the site. I have more of a question to perhaps Marina, to, to anyone else, but of what the status of the paper road is after this is done? Is it unchanged? That is, is the property down below here still um, accessible to the future? I, I didn't get a, a real solid understanding of that in the, in the meetings that I listened to. And uh, that is, that is my, my, my wonderment at this point. Of, uh, I know we discussed He'll certainly be asking that question. OK, thank you. I'm Maren Robinson, and I'm the only Robinson here, so please allow me to speak on behalf of the family interest. We are abutters on the other side of this project. And um, I guess our concern is that when you allow development on the edge of what is open land, you are diminishing habitat uh, in a very significant way and forever. So, um, you know, it's one thing to allow development in areas where you have sort of open spaces in what is already built up land, but here we're being asked to have development that abuts what is, um, with some effort, still open land. Um, and, I, and so I'm just really thinking that in the balance of community interest um, and the interest of, of re retaining open space and habitat for wildlife, that the extension of the building envelope is, I think, particularly um, hazardous to the preservation of, of what those woods now hold. And I would hope you would consider that and give it some weight. Thank you. My name is Evelyn Emmons, and I live at 35 Beach Park Terrace, and I've lived on that street off and on most of my life. My grandmother built the small little house I live in, and uh, through the course of my living here off and on throughout my life, I've seen little ponds destroyed through the construction of housing in that area, and um, land filled by tires and stuff in the area and it upsets me a great deal to see more building going on and, and I'm very concerned about the environment and what's going to happen in, in my neighborhood again. Um, I'm very concerned about getting out onto Beach Bluff, out onto Shore Road because I find it very difficult some mornings pulling out onto Shore Road and having cars riding on the tail of my car as I pull out and I'm on Beach Bluff Terrace and this is going to be even closer to coming up Shore Road and it's, it's pretty frightening this morning, uh, not this morning, but one other morning this week I pulled out and you know I'm going about 20 miles an hour when I first get out there and I thought I was going to be slammed into this car, I came up over that little hill so fast and I'm really concerned that this is going to be creating a uh, very serious traffic hazard because the speeding on Shore Road is out of control. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Uh, hello, I'm uh, Peggy Williams, and I would just hope that the planning board would would really pay special attention to uh, the emails that I have sent, that, uh, that our other neighbors have sent. Uh, I mean, I, I know that I've spent a lot of time 
this last week um, uh, composing an email. And I didn't bring a copy with me, so, so I don't have my points with me. But, but just uh, people uh, um, in the audience have spoken verbally. I've, I've written emails in the last week. I've sent two with, with um, definite, uh, I mean, I've, I've mentioned several things. I've made several points. So I just really hope that, that you take this very seriously. And, um, and what uh, Lisa said, and just you know, know that we uh, care very much, and um, and hopefully we'll uh, we'll find a good solution. Thank you. Excuse me, Mrs. Williams. Um, your email, as I recall, discussed um, some uh, concern with uh, anticipated spacings of plants and size of plants. Um, the plan that is being presented this evening. Um, is that plan consistent with your understanding of the discussions that you've had with the applicant regarding plantings, or is it? Are you still in the of the position that you sent an email that it's that it's somewhat different? I just want to clarify. Um, after the revised plan had been made, um, I, um, Ogden, my husband, uh, and I spoke some more, and we um, we sent in an email. Oh, thank you. Um, and originally, there was uh, the 10-foot spacing, uh, spacing which, which Rick Light and we had um, you know, spoken about. So that was all uh, sort of cleared, clear. Um, but then we called Skillings. I'm just going to read my email right here. We called Skillings, uh, and they said there only needs to be 8-foot spacing between balsam firs, and we request that more firs be planted and an 8-foot spacing uh, so that is, that is a little different, and we would like more hemlocks to be planted at six feet apart instead of the pr proposed 10-foot spacing, which would be more like a tree. And instead, of a, and instead of a tree, we are thinking of hedging in mind. And, and again, I asked, uh, I asked someone at Skillings about this, and they said it was appropriate to have... Um, uh, to have, I'm trying to find where, um, in order to have a natural screen, it was appropriate to plant several more hemlocks uh, at a six foot spacing with, with hedging in mind as opposed to a tree, you know, which takes 15 or 20 years to grow. Um, and we also want to make sure, and this is not just for us, but just everybody, we want to make sure that there is a watering uh, maintenance plan in, in writing from the landscapers. It is a custom for landscapers to, to have a built-in maintenance schedule for in, installed shrubs and trees that last for a season. Um, watering and general maintenance and upkeep of the greenery in the beginning should be the responsibility of the landscaper. Uh, we expect to be notified when the landscapers come to bulldoze and clear-cut trees along our property lines. And again, I'm speaking for other people uh, along the buffer zone um, that we would want to be notified. Uh, we, 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 we might want to save some trees along our property line, so it is important that, that we know in advance when the clear-cutting will happen. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? Thank you. I'd also like to thank all of you for speaking to your points, not going on and on. We really appreciate that. And you certainly have made your points very clearly. The hearing is now closed. Rick, do you want to come back again? Thank you. Questions from the board? Well, I think Peggy had a, Mrs. Williams had a good point about is there going to be a maintenance contract for a certain amount of time with the plantings? Do you know? Yes, through the chair. 
Uh, typically, there'll be a one-year, typical with, with landscaping businesses, a contract would be let out and there'll be a one-year maintenance contract. So it's the obligation of the, the, the uh, contractor to maintain those trees at a you know, watering frequency and fertilization or rate and frequency that they feel is going to protect those trees. If the trees don't survive, they get replaced under warranty. So it's mm -hmm. in their best interest to take care of those trees. Okay. Yeah, the schedule that they, typically the way it's done with a, like a small lot like this is, is rather than dictate to a contractor how to take care of the trees, the performance spec is if the trees don't survive, they have to replace them. And it's up to, a, you know, these are professionals, let them figure out how often they need to, to water those things based on the weather and whatnot, but it's in their best interest to take care of the plant stock. And I just would just like to mention that you're talking about a significant investment in plant stock here, and uh, single fir hemlock will easily a reach over $400, or 250 to 400 in, in, in that range, and that's just the stock that doesn't include the planting, depending on the height. So you're talking significant numbers. So they have an interest in, in maintaining us, as do the owners. Mm -hmm. Other questions? A um, couple of points. One, I um, generally it's been this board's approach, we don't put things in the right of way. I mean, I just, just my, my recollection, somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, again, while I understand the expectation of trying to keep things as they are is, is, is desired, uh, you know, we, 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 we do recognize that it is a paper street and, and a right of way and, and keeping items out of the right of way is appropriate. Um, it, it's also my understanding, I know the applicant and the, and the abutters have met several times, and, and my sense here, my, my understanding is that folks have tried to work both sides to come up with uh, arrangements that work. So my, my, my question to you, Rick, is knowing that the applicant has been willing to do this, uh, given some of the um, additional items that have come back tonight, would the applicant be willing in, in, in looking to try to address those, uh, what I'm sensing as a couple of uh, uh, you know, issues to, to, to address? Yes, again, through the chair. I what I'm hearing is uh, we're kind of caught between a rock and a hard spot, I guess is the best way to put it, that you know, we're trying to be accommodating to the butters, and we certainly understand their concern when you're standing behind what has essentially been someone's lawn, in all fairness, in their property for years. It's not their real property, but they've been utilizing it, and so we're trying to be sensitive to that. And again, this, this picture here kind of tells a little, a little story here. That, uh, you've got a property line. This is, this is uh, uh, Lisa's lawn back in through here. It's still a wall in through here. Back and here. We've walked all these properties, and again, the proposal was if the town didn't mind, it is a paper street, we certainly want to be accommodating that we would space the plants in any way, shape, or form. The note is on the plan, by the way, I want to back up, as per the abutter's request, to allow those to be spaced anywhere they'd like to stake them. Um, we'll just come along, put the stakes in, we'll put them anywhere we'd like on, on these, these two lots here. So if, if we're, we're being asked to take them out of the right-of-way or put them within the outer several feet of the right-of-way, it does, I mean, it changes sort of the inflection when you're standing in someone's lawn. We stand here, what's 10 feet, what's 15 feet when you're living there, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. So we tried to be accommodating. So I, I guess I'm not sure, I, I'm, I'd offer up a, a solution here, is that there be indemnifications given to the, or, or agreed to by the property owners that if the trees are placed in the right of way, where they'd like to have them, and we're, we're fine putting them, they're spacing within the right of way, and if at any time that right of way is someone exercises a right to do something in the right of way, or the town exercises a right to do something in the right of way, that there's an indemnification so that those trees could be removed at their cost and without having the town or whoever, I mean, not saying this is ever going to happen, but that's the purpose of the right of way, I think we're talking legally, that there's indemnification, so they would have, the onus would be on them to, you know, that a contractor wouldn't have to replace those trees at their cost. And maybe that's a solution that would fit. It's, it's a road that's really, I think we recognize isn't going to be extended for any practical purpose. It is a right-of-way. It is a paper street. There are certain rights vested in that street. It's not their property. I think we'd be perfectly willing to leave the trees where we had proposed them if the town would agree to some, an agreement like that. Is that fair game? Well, I, I, have an, I have a question and then a suggestion. Mm -hmm. The question is, is the rock wall going to be removed? I'm sorry? Is the rock wall going to be removed at this time? W no, we're not asking for uh, Lisa's lot. No. So the rock wall is staying in the middle of the right-of-way? Yeah, it's basically more or less in the middle of the right-of-way, I believe. 
Yeah. And it's, we're not, there's nothing in our plan that calls for that to be removed. No. I'm wondering about taking the trees that are, um, that originally were in the middle of the right of way mm -hmm. and actually moving them to the northern edge of the right of way so that you have a staggered row of trees, which I personally think is more interesting, um, so that you have the trees along um, the Ogden's property on the south side of the right of way. And then where the rock wall is, you jut and put the trees to the north side of the right of way. And then there isn't any question about indemnification. I mean, we've talked about streets in order to make them smaller, having, I forgot what you call those things, Paul, help me. Um, those things that come out in the streets, sh uh, chicanes. chicanes, so people actually have to go around things. So I don't personally, perhaps Maureen, you can correct me, see why we can't stagger the trees, which would solve your problem, still not reduce any of the number of trees that we have here, and wouldn't cost, you know, wouldn't be any difference in price for the person developing the land and perhaps might solve the problem very simply. Now, if there's a Thoughts. problem with that, somebody... Any comments on that? I mean, it... Oh, yeah. the drainage ditch. It's, it's right along the edge of that. I mean, you're going to be awful close to that drainage on the far, far edge of it. I mean, I suppose parenthetically. I think one of the things, we're, we're, to be honest with you, one of the things we're talking about here is we're talking about trees that aren't... Um, uh, you have two feet on the girth of a tree, or, or 18 inches, it's almost immeasurable when you're talking about Imagine your Christmas tree, whether it, but when you start talking about five feet, three feet, those sort of distances when we're talking about planting trees, I mean, the root ball itself is two feet in diameter. Now, it, it, gets, it gets, rather than staggering trees, we end up with sort of a linear type of, we wanted to space them, or the abutters, I believe, did to space them. We end up with sort of a linear type of, you know, linear edge along the edge of the right-of-way. The trees themselves are going to be well over five feet into the right-of-way. The, the body of the tree, the stem of the tree, can be in the outer edge. So that, that's why I... I I mean, I'm asking, I guess, the board if, if there's any reason why there couldn't be a compromise in this particular case where this right-of-way, as I mentioned with indemnifications, that, that they could be put in the right-of-way. It would certainly look more attractive, I think, to have them spaced and, and articulated. Is there any way to make that happen? Indemnification before or something like that? If that's the right word to use. Um, I don't think we've ever done it before. And, and mm -hmm. keep in mind that that is a right-of-way that's Every single person who owns a lot on the subdivision plan has rights in that right of way. Mm -hmm. So you're proposing to put in plantings <coughs> because you want buffering in the exact place where they could be cut down. Exactly. And I guess that's the the concern I have is that I think this is a bigger issue than just trees on one side of a right of way or another. I mean, the applicant owns a significant amount of land past the building envelope that we're discussing. Mm -hmm. And it's serviced by that right-of-way. That would be the access. So I, I guess one of my questions is, is there contemplation of future development back there? Or could there be? And there's significant wetlands. And if so, I think we need to consider a bigger picture. Because if there is consideration for development, the right-of-way has to be upgraded to a 50-foot standard, is that correct? Um, which means sheds go, coops go, rock walls go, because you need to use that to get back there. Mm -hmm. So that's a much larger issue, but um, it's one that I would, I'm, I'm curious. Through the chair, I'd be glad to answer that. We talked about this in the site walk, and that's a fair question. First of all, the sheds and structures, as I understand, are going to go. The board, the town has requested that they go, and the abutters have been, we've talked about that. So there's another the plan that requires that those sheds and any physical structure be moved outside the right-of-way. That's on the plan. Um, the second part is to extend the right-of-way. You never say never, but the reality of putting a 50-foot right-of-way, when you've only got 100, this is less than 100 feet, and having anything up to the building window, it's. I, I just can't even imagine that ever happening in this back land here, given the wetlands, given the topography, given the need that you would have to upgrade from here. You would have to make this a non-conforming lot, which couldn't be done legally. You'd have to make a right-of-way on the first sort of a, a throttle. You'd have a throttle. You'd come into the property. You've got something that's tight to make that 50 feet. 
you would have to make this existing house non-conforming or cut off part of the house. And if another person who had interest in the property were going to do that, it doesn't make sense because you cannot create a legally non-conforming lot in this case. So that's sort of the throttle or the gate that would say that that really couldn't ever realistically happen. The second part is, though, in terms of development, we talked about this on the planning board site walk, is you know, there, in, uh, there's no plan at this point to do this, and I want to be clear about the applicant said so there's no you know, agreements, there's no plan to do this, but the abutters, if could th theoretically purchase own this lot to be sold, they could purchase pieces of this lot to extend their own enjoyment of the property onto what is and, and increase the size of their lots. And so they would own these properties. And to me, that, I mean, just this is my own opinion, that seems to be to be maybe something that's probably reasonable and where butters have expressed interest that, that, that might, there might be a likelihood of that, that happening you know, through a private sale when this lot is sold. To extend a road in here, I, I can't say you can't do it, but I just don't see how it, it's just not a, a so realistic. How, how realistic, though, is, are, is the possibility of a butters purchasing that, that property? They've, I can let the applicant speak, but they've, they've expressed interest. You've been approached by some of the abutters, correct? about the idea of purchasing some of the... We should probably, again, talk of the bigger picture here, um, looking at the property. And again, and I'm sort of flipping around with different scales here, but again, the project as we have proposed it is these first three lots is right here. Remember from the sidewalk? Mm -hmm. that we, we ended up on the sidewalk and getting this lot right here, and we still have 30% of that lot left be, beyond us. It, it's a right. large lot. It's huge, I realize. It's, it's huge. And so you start talking about the expansiveness of that lot and what could happen. You know, realistically, for these people to want to purchase some land off the back of this lot, a lot of it's wetland or wet soils, it's doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't have good soils for perking and building, um, and allow themselves the opportunity to expand their lawn ex just to have the the sake of just owning the open space, whatever the reasons are. To me, that makes sense. Is there a proposal to do that at this point? No. But, I mean, that's the way I would see if that land was going to be developed. I can ask the applicant, you folks, if you'd see any differently, but that seems to me to be something that's been approached. It's, it's reasonable to expect that. Is it going to? Who knows? You know. Is there any thought at all about perhaps preserving that land in perpetuity and getting some tax benefits to the mm. developer and uh, just leaving the land alone. The back part of the land. Way back. The rear of the the rear of the lot. It's been discussed. Hmm? It's been discussed. We we were approached by some neighbors about purchasing. We had an understanding that. So are those ongoing discussions now? I mean, is, this, is that for real, or is it just something that's floated? Oh. Brought up. Okay. Brought up. Okay. I, I've, I've just been told that when we ask a question, somebody else answers. You need to go to the podium so that it becomes part of the minutes. I'm sorry. That's my fault. So the next time I ask a question, that's going to come up. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the, hear the hearing has been closed. If, if, um, if the board agrees to just a question, not an opinion, is that all right or should we not allow that? A question to? A question to the? Yes, yes. Is that all right with everybody? Not an opinion, just a question. Yeah. Well, you can just ask a question from where you are. Barbara, my opinion would be only if it was a question that hadn't been raised. Pardon? Only if it was a question that had not been raised. Only if it's a question that has not been raised. Okay, come to the podium and ask the question. So I'm Clara Cohan still. Uh, so my question is, what if then, if the back property was either deeded over as a trust or however that works, or purchased by the people, and that there really aren't, they aren't and can't, whatever, extend that road, then would there be a fairly easy ability to then, uh, from the end of where the driveway comes in and meets the other house, to abandon the town, to abandon the road from there to wherever 
the land has either been turned over or purchased, so that all abutters on either side would then have 12 and a half feet. Because it doesn't sound like there is ever going to be a road, you know, through there. And so, you know, why make us go through the song and dance and move things and plant and, you know, whatever, if that could be a possibility? Um, the rights in paper streets is regulated by state law. And state law says that once a subdivision plan is recorded in the registry, the paper street is created. And the only way to what we call vacate the paper street is also set down in state law. And that says that you need to go through a street vacation process where all of the subdivision lot owners are notified, all their mortgagees are notified. It's, it's a tedious expensive process involves times with lawyers and the final vote has to happen by the town council. So no, there's no simple way to do it. And I don't mean to, if I could add something to that, and, and what Maureen has said is certainly true, and in that process, as I, and I'm no attorney, but if everyone doesn't agree to it and sign off on it basically, if one person holds out who has rights or interests in that road, that's all it takes. You know, one of the things that is very clear to me is that if we approve a private access way, and this mm -hmm. speaks to what you said, Beth, if we approve a private access way, that pretty well negates anything that could happen beyond mm -hmm. the private access way because all that gives the right to is one lot. Right. And the private access way is too narrow to put in a private street. So it would mean that a future planning board would have to really essentially undo everything that has been done at this point. Um, I mean, we started out with a private street that's, at least I felt very strongly, needed to be 50 feet, period. And 50 feet left illegal lots, no room, or nothing else. Uh, and to go back from approving a private access way, which is much narrower and much more agreeable in this situation, especially since it only involves one extra house lot, uh, it, it seems to me, and, and perhaps Maureen, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, that it being extended and enlarged is next to impossible after this. Is that correct or incorrect? I would never say that. Never say that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> For the record, I would never say that. <laughs> but I think it's unlikely. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Um, you know, we can't, we can't ask, allow too many additional questions. I know I allowed one. <laughs> so, and that opens Pandora's box. Why don't we ask the questions from the board, and then we'll consider at the end if there's something we haven't covered. Okay, because we still have some other questions here, I think. Madam Chair, when the board's done with the questions, could I have an opportunity to address some of the comments from the floor? Yes. The end? Thank you. Absolutely. You want to go ahead now? All right. I'd be, be glad to, yeah. And just if I could take a minute, some of the, the questions, um, Peggy, when you talked about uh, the tree plantings, eight feet, ten feet, again, it's, it's the planting of trees and, and dealing with, with stock is, is not an exact science like doing roadways. Our landscape architect is a professional licensed landscape architect. For those size trees recommended approximately 10 feet. Those can be adjusted in the field. There's no intent here to deceive by spacing at 10 feet because 8 feet would save us two trees. We met in the field. We talked about double screening for the headlights for, for Adam for the comment. Uh, we've done this all with, in, in good faith to... Excuse me, you know, and so there's, there's nothing disingenuous. It's just, Talk to a nursing unit at Skillens versus a professional landscape architect. A couple of feet here, the different standards. We have to go with a professional landscape architect for the seals on the drawings. And but that's what I'm trying to say. It doesn't make a big difference when you talk about several feet like that. Uh, we, again, we did talk about doubling up the trees here for the specific purpose that we met in the field about protecting you from headlights. And again, this is a single family residence, not like a street. This is only a driveway. And, and so I think, and, and that was discussed, I think. That in the field. So the plantings and the spacing are all in accordance with, with acceptable practices and standards. Um, and, and same with the, the tree sizes as well. Um, the other, other issue that was brought up um, in terms of uh, the, the drainage. Um, the drainage that we have, um, and I think Clary might have brought this up, I'm not mistaken. 
The drainage that we have along here on the plan, there is going to be a small, uh, culvert here, small like opening, uh, Filtration area, grass area, and a culvert that's going to be buried. We talked about this in the field. The grade of the terrain will be the same as it is today. It'll be cleared, of course, in here along into the grading, and there will be an outfall of a level of spreader, which is a, a, a way of dissipating the what little stormwater is. They'll dissipate the stormwater, let it go into the called sheet flow, and, and actually go into the wetland, like it pretty much does now. But that there's been no change in the drainage concept here. In fact, because we have a T area here that won't be vegetated, it'll be you know graded. Revegetated with grass, and uh, I think we even agreed that possibly uh, the wood pile will stay here uh, from the Williams property, as long as it's okay with everybody else. So, so um, we've made an attempt to go as far as we possibly can to keep things very subtle and to you know um, deal with those sort of issues, and to the best we can with the space we have to uh, provide the buffers and to you know deal with the drainage and whatnot without pushing it any farther than we have to into the right-of-way. So. And there's one other comment I'd like to just address. Just before you get off that, there was a specific question about um, only seeding the T portion of the turnaround and if that was going to change your drainage plan. No, it does not. No. No, it'll reduce the amount of drainage, but it won't change that the shape of it is, is all exactly the same as the original plan, the grading of it. It will reduce the amount of, of stormwater. Do you have another comment? I have one comment. This refers back to, while well, I have the floor here, to a comment I think by Mr. Member Collins at the last meeting at the site walk about a wetlands report. Uh, we had Albert Frick, we had a short time frame, prepare a small wetlands report. And I, if we can make that a part of the record tonight, it just identifies the soils and plant types that they found on the property. Other questions from the board? Maureen, uh, did um, the applicant get a copy of the OST May 7th letter? Yes. Okay. Yes. You got a copy of my memo? The, I don't think so. Was there, was there a second memo? There should have been a memo that I wrote. You got a copy of that? A recent one. We got the first memo, the, the, the original memo. memo. Tonight's meeting that was mailed to you? <laughs> and attached to that would have been a letter from OST. So uh, I guess I'll plead the, the fifth. <laughs> I haven't seen it, unfortunately. Oh. Are there any comments that are left unaddressed? That I believe we had spoken with, with Steve Harding, the, the engineer, and basically in agreement that all his issues were minor. We thought we'd address them all. And there shouldn't be any outstanding issues that, uh, or at least that couldn't be conditioned upon approval, I would think. He had, uh, I don't know how you want to handle this, Maureen, but I think the applicant should have a chance to review the comments. I don't know what's going on. We've sent memos to his office for the last two months, and I know last month he didn't get it. I don't know why he didn't receive one this month. I, I just, I don't know what to tell you at this point. I, I think one of the things we do need to discuss, we still have to get back to the, the right of way and the wall and the trees. But before we do that, I'd really like to discuss the building envelope. The what? I couldn't discuss the building envelope. Okay. Um, I'd like to understand where you have it now and discuss it. Just to address Mr. Collins' comment, if the board was um, ready to entertain a motion for approval tonight, one of the proposed conditions of approval would be that the plan to be revised per the town engineer's comment. So they would be able to. We're agreeable to that, but I think we had all the comments we thought pretty well addressed. So we're, we'd be certainly agreeable to that. Without, without reading the comments? I would like to take a peek while we're sitting down in a minute. But. <laughs> I can't imagine that there's anything that we can't uh, take in, but I would like to see those before the night's out, before a motion's made. Uh, Madam Chair, address your question. The building envelope, again, this long, this is the, the lot itself, 2.8 acres, I believe it is. And the building window on the sidewalk, uh, I know, Madam Chair, you want to look at the sidewalk. This is that wetland pocket we walked through the little walking path here. And there's an area back here with two large white birches. We stood and said that there's a potential there, again, parenthetically, the potential for someone to put a shed or a barn or something back there. 
and it, it just seems a reasonable use of the property to, for the applicant to allow that at some point in time, allow someone the opportunity, although there are no plans to do so, there's simply this lot will be put for sale and the house will be built here, and still leaving all this land back here as non-building units. The answer to the question is, the building window is this area in here up to the wetlands, but not including the wetlands in this area here beyond the wetlands. And it's only about 40, 40 feet wide, 36 feet wide. That back part, it gets pretty narrow. So this is, that, this is not part of the building envelope. We were, the original plan, which is out to here, we pulled that back. So at this point, this is, would not be developable area for any sort of structure at all. Um, would it be possible to stop the building envelope prior to the wetland and still have room to put a secondary structure like a barn in there if somebody wanted to do that? The answer to that, I think given the building, it'd be difficult to put it, I mean, excuse me, we've well, we got the septic system. Sure. I mean, the septic system is down here on the base of the slope. It would be tight. It would be difficult. It just, it seemed, again, no one's proposing a barn, but for reasonable use of the lot where it's per, or permitted use is just to allow that to possibly happen when we want, wanted to do that in the future. And it was just, if we looked at the land, it seemed like a reasonable use. The applicant was looking for, looking for the opportunity to do that if it, if it ever arose in terms of marking the lot. And, and it, it just, there's a nice spot back in here that you stand there and says, yeah, it could possibly happen without... There was also perhaps a suggestion of leaving some space around the wetland, um, buffering it on each side by, say, 25 feet. It would be perfectly agreeable to that. So that essentially the building envelope would be in two pieces, I guess. With a 25 foot buffer on the wetland, and we would be agreeable to do that as a condition. How does the rest of the board feel about that? It's been similar to what we've done in other places, Barbara. I would also suggest that that buffer will be physically marked so that no inadvertent filling mm -hmm. occur and that there's a you know, clear demarcation line. So we would need to perhaps make that a, a it's agreeable to the builder make that a, a, a condition that there be a 25 foot buffer around the wetland and that that be marked um, typically Maureen, I've forgotten what's used, or Paul, perhaps you know the kinds of markings. In the past, in, in two cases, you actually put decorative, some decorative picket fencing on the corners to kind of visually mark where you're not supposed to go past. Mm -hmm. In another situation, you actually had um, round discs approved that were mounted mm -hmm. on the trees where the, where the buffer began. Uh, there's no one set way, but the idea would have a real physical see with the eye, avoid, oops, missed it, we're in the wetland now. And we're agreeable to any practice that the, the board would, would like to do. Any problem with that? As long as it doesn't affect access. The building envelope doesn't affect the Thompson Road, so I don't think that's that much. Doing the building envelope here? Yeah. Well, Right, and this is the Thompson Road. So we're talking about a, a building envelope wetland set back on the yeah. side. We can't put an envelope on the, we can't put a 25-foot uh, buffer on the Thompson Road right away. We don't, no. it, right. it doesn't have any effect. In, right. okay. Barbara, I'd be in favor of uh, just having the applicant and the, and the town planner work out an acceptable method of, of, of identifying that, whether it be some fencing or markings on trees or whatever would be prudent and reasonable. Else? I think it's an excellent idea. Okay. Um, we still have to deal with the trees and the mm. stone wall that's going to be left in the middle of the right of way. And mm -hmm. Rick, um, Maureen provided on the podium there the um, May 7th. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'll take a quick peek while we're talking here. Barbara, while he's reading that, another item that I believe the board should uh, uh, weigh in on is um, the structures that are within the right-of-way and the ultimate responsibility and, and, and method for which they be removed. Um, as, as the plans currently state, um, that the responsibility of removing those structures is the owner's responsibility. 
Um, is there any, any discussion on that part in terms of whether it's the applicant's responsibility to bear the cost to do this, the owner's, uh, what happens if nothing is done? Um, I guess I'd like to try to resolve that as well. Somewhere here, did it, did it say that the contractor would work it out with the owners and they would pay them? Somewhere I remember seeing that. I thought I did. But the thing is, it, it plans explicitly state it's the responsibility of the owners of the contractors yeah. who don't have any connection to this approval. Yes. My, rec my recommendation would be to modify that, that we uh, require the applicant to be at the cost and removal of those structures unless a alternate arrangement is made with the uh, abutting property owner. If the abutting property owner wants to pick up that structure and move it back to their property, that's fine. Uh, if not, the applicant is responsible for removing it. In any way he, he wants to? Since it's on his land, I guess. I mean, th this is an issue where I don't want to impose on the owner, I mean, the, the adjacent property owners, they're their structures. If they want them moved back onto their property, that's fine. Uh, I think asking the applicant to do that for the owners, I think, is reasonable. Uh, but if, if, if nothing is done, they, they need to be removed by some, by some way, shape, or form. I, I'm not sure that I entirely agree, <laughs> only because um, I usually try really hard to, to be fair and to balance, but in this case, the abutters have encroached on land that really wasn't theirs. And I'm not sure that asking the, it's always fair to ask the person who's developing to bear the cost of certain things. I think it's fine to ask them to put trees in and to make them good size and to put in landscaping, but to ask them to remove things that are encroachments, I'm not sure is entirely. I, I agree. Correct. Yeah. Does anybody else have any? No, I, I agree as well. It's, and, uh, you know, I think my, my preference would, would be to make this as clear as possible. Um, I think as the town, we want to make sure that the right of way is cleared. But I agree with you, Barbara, that these structures were put on land that didn't belong to, doesn't belong to the people who put the structures on it. So I really don't think it should be the applicants. I don't think the applicants should bear the cost of moving something that they had nothing to do with. Somebody put it, put something on land that wasn't theirs. So. And they knew it. I mean, during the site walks, people were very clear with us that they knew that this wasn't their, their property. Well, the note on the plan, I'm forgetting what it says. says I, do, do we give them a time limit? Well, there are, there are two then. notes. There's a note five and a note nine. And the, and the note five that says, everything except those in note nine shall be removed by the contract prior to commencing work on the affected areas. And then note nine says, Sheds and structures in Thompson Road right of way are to be removed by their respective property owners. I think that's quite clear. Yeah. That's on drawing one. Yeah, but how, do you, how do you make that a condition to an applicant when they have no ability to enforce the private owners to move the, 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 the coop or the shed or the doghouse? You can't. I mean, we want, we want the applicant to take responsibility for doing it, but we can't give the applicant the power to make somebody else do it, right? The problem is that, you know, they're not going to get moved. That's a potential yeah. issue. Yeah, and, and, you know, I know this is, I'm always doing this, but so then the new owner of Lot 2 builds their house, and they move in, and encroachments have been tolerated from one side, so they decide that's where they're going to put their, their pool house or whatever it is. I mean, I, I'm concerned that you're setting a tenor for the rest of the neighborhood, and what happens is, what happens all the time, people come into our office and they say, you know, so-and-so is doing this, and my response is, it's a civil issue between you and your neighbors, and you have to get an attorney. So to the extent we can do something to prevent 
that won't happen. Just to make sure everybody tries to get along, yeah. <laughs> Play nice. And, that, and that's where, again, while I'm, I'm not in, in favor, I mean, I agree with you, but I'm not in favor of putting undue burden on the applicant, the applicant is here. They would have the ability, if we requested them, to remove those structures or move them onto the, you know, abutting property owner's property. Um, I see that as an opportunity to make sure that we don't have a case where nothing gets done. We do, we do end up with a town in the middle of it, and I, I don't think that's a good way, to, good way to go. I think you're right, Paul. I think we, we only have the ability to require the applicant to do it. Yeah. We don't have the ability to require anybody else to do it that's not looking yeah. at this application. I, I agree. I think it's foolish that they have to move something that's not, you know, something they didn't put there, but I, we don't have any other means to be able to address that. Yeah, I agree with you completely. It's really a, yeah, we're, we're up against a difficult situation. So I think we'd have to change the notes or request the notes five, actually seven and nine. Yes. Madam Chair, if I, yeah, I, I just consulted with the applicant, obviously. Um, they're concerned, they're, they're agreeable, their understanding is all, first of all, the applicants have agreed to, to do this, but understanding also that the world, I mean, things happen. Um, is there a way to say that, that, give them the opportunity to move the sheds, and if not, then the applicant would, would remove the sheds? Maybe we can have a time limit in it. Okay. Just to point out. There's a proposed condition, note three, number three. It says that nine, note nine and drawing one be amended to read that the applicant will be responsible for removing the structures within the Thompson Road right of way. Um, I'm going to mail a copy of this approval to the abutters. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how the applicant moves the structures. The, okay. the applicant hopefully sure. would work with the abutters and together they'd work out getting it moved. It doesn't mean that the applicant would have to move them, but if no one else does it, the applicant that, would be ultimately responsible. We're absolutely fine with that. That, that makes total sense. Okay. Which is basically what you were just talking about. If you want about. to get the Boy Scouts to move them for you, fine. Okay. Okay. So that's taken care of. Is that sort of All right. Um, and then we need to add about the uh, buffer in the building envelope. Now we have we can go back to the trees and the rock wall in the middle of the uh, uh, Rick, do you, is it your opinion that there are sufficient trees to to uh, make the abutters happy. It's just the, the size and the placement and the location. Would that be fair? I, I, I mean, I can, I can speak to the abutters. We, we, we met with the abutters. We, we were looking at ways to, to do screening and, and do it reasonably. And, and I think we all came to pretty much you know, agreements. I thought we had agreements. So I think one of the notes we put on the plan was, again, the whole issue of the right of way is trying to give them the best enjoyment of that, was to allow them to stake and locate those trees where they wanted to. We have a note on the plan. It was requested by uh, uh, two of the abutters. Um, and I, I guess what I'm saying is we're agreeable to, to, to either uh, if, if the board is willing to allow us to go in the right way. Can you, can you say that again? You're we're agreeable to either leaving the plan as is, which doesn't, with, with the trees being moved to one side, which doesn't make the abutters too, too happy or going back to the way the plan was, which is allowing the trees in the right of way, if the board can to agree to that, we're, and allowing them to place them in the right of way where they want them to be, I mean, spaced out. Um, and again, we're talking about on the, the, the Williams lot, which is the front lot, you know, we have, we're talking about keeping the trees to be clear on the side of the right of way for obvious reasons that need to be discussed. We're talking about the Cullen lot and the, uh, sorry, the Baltar lot right here, this lot, and uh, Lot here, so that we have in those two circumstances, if the board would allow those trees to go in the right of way, we're we're fine with it. What we don't, I guess, we don't feel totally comfortable putting them right the outer five feet on the north side of the right of way because we do have a drainage pipe going right along the side of the right of way. Is there any chance that that drainage pipe can be moved further to the north and not affect? 
it'd certainly be tight, let's put it that way. I never put it. Here's, this is the grading plan which shows the uh, house building window into the right of way. This is the drain pipe right along the edge of the right of way. So it's, it's pretty close, within five feet. That has to yeah. stay within the right of way? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the easement. Drain. The, the easement. Drain. The easement, yes, right here. So you really can't move that pipe. Right. I mean, I, I come back and I sort of sort of beating a dead horse here. I understand the board's concerned with putting trees in the right of way, whether it's setting precedent, but these people have lived here for years with structures in the right of way. They, there hasn't been an issue, other than the fact that the, you know, if the trees were put here, we've all agreed that there's, there's really never going to be a road here. If 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 there was to be a barn or shed back here, they could work a, a small driveway around again. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but we talked about that in the field. I think that could all be ver well worked out as long as the town didn't have a problem putting the trees in the right of way. And as long as there's an understanding, I guess legally I would think that you don't even have to have an indemnification, I would think, and I'm not an attorney, I don't profess to be one, but if there were structures in the right of way and people who had rights in the right of way wanted to extend it today, that's what people are, they'd have the right to do so. If the trees are planted in that right of way and someone who has rights in that right of way, uh, maybe the abutters, maybe when some of the abutters sell out and somebody wants to utilize some of those rights for access, they have every right to go in and cut those trees down. They don't need permission to do so subject to any approvals that might be required. So whether the board, whether there needs to be indemnification or not, really, I don't, I think it's a new point. They would have the right to do so. As long as the applicants understand that the trees that will be planted at, at no small expense are at risk, potentially, theoretically. Probably not practically, but theoretically they're at risk. If somebody Rick, could. Um, let's look at the drainage plan here because it does seem like the pipe is set back some distance from the northern part of the road. Yeah, and, and just perhaps moving those trees is without interfering with the pipe, but toward the northern edge mm -hmm. might be really attractive and actually give the abutter a little bit more visual space without really changing anything for you people. So you're talking about just the northern edge of the northern, northern edge of the right of way here. Without moving the pipe at all. Pipe. Without. I mean, you all have to be the one to say whether the pipe would be interfered with It'd by be, the roots of the tree. Yeah, five to ten feet. Pat? Like? Rick, it, it would still be on the right-of-way, and your pipe is off the right-of-way. Right. That right. would be on the... The trees would be inside the right-of-way. The pipe is on the north side. It's outside. It looks like it's five or so feet yes, it into is. the property right. itself. And that might mac maximize your visual you know, benefits without jeopardizing you in any way whatsoever. Right. Yeah, I, yeah. Go out and I can understand it. You know, I think it's, it's, they'd probably do all right. I mean, I'm not a... You're going to have the same problem on the other side. Possibly, possibly. I mean, it's, it's probably closer than you want to be, but... Um, well, Rick, could you move that pipe five feet to the north and still be within the easement? You could shift a little bit, a couple of feet maybe. What do you... Yeah, get close to the house. Oh, is that, that be the concern in yeah. the house? Can we ask, is this a question? No. Okay. <laughs> we can't reopen the public hearing. We're trying to deal with what you said and, and uh... Can you change it into a question? <laughs> it's a question. Ask a question. This is the last question. If the drainage pipe could be moved two feet, and the trees could be moved to within seven feet of the edge. Do we gain enough room that way? Well, that's what we're trying to work out right here. But the trees could be moved maybe not to five feet, but to seven. No, no, we're talking about moving the trees to the northern edge of the, of the right-of-way. That's what we're talking about right here. But maybe they could, instead of giving that five-foot buffer at the northern edge of the right-of-way, they could be given a seven-foot right-of-way, and then they gain. Well, we, we can only, we have to leave enough room for the roots. So okay. we're doing the best we can Thank here. You. Okay. I'm fine with that solution. That, okay. Um, is that an okay solution? Is that an okay solution? I'm. Yeah, as I'm long as, that? as long, in, in my opinion, it's, it's okay as long as when the trees we're not trees. requiring the applicant to get into a whole new engineering study to relocate a drainage pipe. I mean, I, my, my opinion is that the applicant has 
it seems, been very open to the concerns of the abutters. And I know the cost of these trees. These are thousands and thousands of dollars of trees they're putting in. So I would hope that we don't end up requiring additional expense for the applicant to figure out where to put trees. I understand the concerns of the abutters completely. But I think the applicant has put forth great effort to address some of the concerns. I do too. So what is your opinion? Well, I just spoke with the applicant. They're, they're concerned about having the trees pushed up against the north edge of the property line. That, and that's, uh, you have to re-engineer the drainage and probably move them aside. It doesn't require the board to make a condition and re-engineer the pipe and all that. So they, they would prefer that they have the ability to put them in the space about the right of way or keep them in the southern edge of the right of way. That would be their preference. Well, I think if the brick wall is, if the wall's already there, I don't see any problem with the trees being there. I was just going to say the same thing. If that stone wall isn't going to be moved. But, you know, common sense says that, but what does that do for us for the next project down the line? Well, I'm not sure there's going to be much likelihood for the next project. But. I mean, not necessarily a Thompson Road project, but another, I'm just. Another similar. Another similar one, I'll I guess. Exactly. The precedent issue, Maureen. Does it, have you had to deal with this in the past, putting, putting no. things in the right of way? Every decision you make is referred to later on. Right. You, you yourself ask me, well, have we done this in the past? Yeah, yeah so, I know. No. Is there, a, is there a, a, a conventional wisdom to dealing with stone walls? Usually, what usually happens with stone walls is most of the time they're really old. Yeah. And, um, I can tell you we had some stone walls in the Cross Hill subdivision mm -hmm. and basically what we did is where they were in open space we kept them because they have a nice feature. Mm -hmm. um, if they happen to be located on a property line it's, it's convenient you try to keep them but right. this one doesn't seem to be there. Right. But it's been there a long time and you know all you do is go out and take the stones out and the wall's gone if someone had to build a road. It's, it's just taking something brand new like a tree and, and putting it someplace where, you know, you have to assume when they built that stone wall, they weren't intentionally putting it where they thought a road might someday be. Yeah. Okay. Just, just one point. Um, the applicant puts in that drainage pipe. Um, all the vegetation on top of that area is going to obviously be wiped out because they have to dig and put the mm -hmm. pipe in. And having trees 10 feet away might be a nice visual buffer for the new lot. Mm. Make some decisions here. Well, we could ask for okay. a motion. <laughs> I still would prefer the trees in the middle of the right of way. President or not, I, I think that in this situation that the likelihood of anything happening beyond what's happening now is so remote that I'd like to we should make the best decision we can in terms of what's there now and not worry about 40 years from now. Madam Chair, if I could just comment, I, I know I've said this before, I don't want to be redundant, but it, it, and I'm just trying to sway the board obviously here, but that because the right of way has been in existence, People have utilized it as their, their common property. And to allow it to continue to be used that way in the parts that aren't being affected by the road, in other words, back into these lots, back into here, by allowing the trees, again, it seems to me that the buffer is going to serve. You got to ask, what's the purpose of the trees and who is it serving? Is it, is it benefiting? Is it a buffer for the sake of screening? Well, we made it very clear to the abutters that uh, other than the, the Williamses up here, we were actually trying to screen because. These trees aren't intended to be a full screen. These trees are intended to be a softening of, of, of change in the character of the woods. I mean, I mean you're going to see the house next door. 
But it's a solving, that's what buffers are all about. It's solving, it's adding landscaping. You don't typically add landscaping in your lawn to make a screen unless you want to hide something. This is a neighborhood. Your houses are looking at houses. It's part of a neighborhood. But it's, it's softening it. So I, I come back to allowing the trees to be in the right of way. If at any time that right of way, someone exercises a right, one of the abutters to do something in that right of way, it's at their risk. They're the ones at risk. And I, it, just as they are today with the sheds, and, and the, those sheds are at risk, and, and the time has come to roost down the sheds because of the situation. But um, we need to be agreeable. I won't speak to them. Planning them, you know, spaced in the right of way, like we first talked about with the abutters, It'd certainly make their lots more attractive the way they've been utilizing their lots. And I think it's a, a great compromise, as long as everyone understands that it doesn't have to be put in writing or as a condition that the rights currently exist. For those that have rights to utilize that right away, if someone can show they have rights and demonstrate it and do something that's within their rights, and if it involves cutting the trees down, just as if it's today there was a 12-inch oak and somebody had rights, one of these abutters or the applicant had rights to, to utilize their rights in the right of way, they could cut the oak down and, and use it for a, a walking path or whatever rights they had in that. They wouldn't need permission, per se. So this is, I don't see this as any different. What this involves, however, is a pretty good monetary investment on the part of the applicant. Um, and, but if, once they're planted, they will serve for the enjoyment of the water, but they'll also serve for the enjoyment of the people on, on this side of the lot, too. So we tried to do this in a way that it benefits both parties. I, I'm curious why the applicant would be interested in having the trees in the center of the right-of-way if that's going to be the access to potentially a barn or some structure down the road. And how would you get back there say with equipment or, or mm -hmm. a vehicle? We're talking about, well, first of all, we haven't, planned, we haven't even thought, of, we talked about this, we haven't really thought about how you get access other than the fact that the only, a reasonable approach to that, just being, again, I don't want to get myself in a hole over saying the plan is things we have. But as we walk the site, the, uh, I mean, I'll be honest with you, my opinion, was my lot, the most reasonable way to get to this back part would be to apply for a permit in the RP2 here. But if you had to, if you had to go over the top and meander a road through the right of way through here, you, the trees we're talking about on Lisa's lot uh, and right here, and Cohen's is over here, spacing those trees out. I don't, I mean, the likelihood is you could get an a eight foot, 10 foot drive to meander around the trees. If you make a wall of trees along this edge right here, that, to me, that would violate your ability to put a road right away in, not having our driveway, not spacing them out. The plan that we had proposed, meeting with butters, that have several, some of the trees on their lot and some of the right away. At the flexibility of the applicant to stake those trees where they want them, we would plant them. So you're, you're suggesting that the one way to get to the the back building envelope would be to go through the wetland. If a permit could be obtained, I'm just saying, I, we haven't looked at this. If I was to build a barn back here, we have not studied again or looked at this at all. It's just an idea that was brought up because it, the, the lot, the current zoning allows that building window. And, and, and so they compromised by cutting it short, finding an area that would be reasonable. In case somebody wanted to do that, not that it's planned, have we even looked at how a road would come through there? No, we haven't studied it, haven't looked at it. I'm just standing there in the woods. I look at things from a practical standpoint. It seems pretty easy to, to do something like this, but maybe this is the way to go. We just haven't looked at it, but uh, if that was an option. I, I don't want to predict into the future, all, only to know that by having a space plantings in through here, I think it would allow more opportunity to, if someone wanted to put a driveway in, than to have a wall of trees at the northern edge of this property line, just as a wall right tucked up against the edge of the property line. And, and if so, if a tree had to be removed, the applicant removes the tree, puts a driveway in, and plants a new tree five feet away if there's a roadway. So I'm, I just offer that up that. I have a, another question, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got the five trees with the wall. Then you've got more trees in the right of way that don't seem to be a question. Now, why are there some trees that aren't questions in the middle of the right of way? Uh, uh, and other ones are? Both, both properties. Oh, it's all of them. Together, yeah. together, okay. both properties. All right. They all moved in the new plan, didn't they? I'm sorry. They were all on the edge. Okay. Thank you. All right. Barbara? Yes. Um, while I, while it is my opinion that we should keep any buffer, structures, whatever, 
outside of the right of way. Um, given the fact that the applicant has met with the residents, that the residents, um, you, know, you know, the residents have given their feedback that due to the unique circumstances of this, I am inclined to stick with the original landscape plan as, it's, as it states. But I do want to caution folks that um, if this plan sticks and somebody comes forward at some time and does remove those, then now you don't have a buffer. And I just need folks to understand that. Right. Um, that's very important. Don't come back and say, well, now we don't have a buffer anymore. Um, you know, the opportunity for the buffer is here. And I, you know, I applaud the applicant. I applaud you folks for working hard in what, as I know, is a very emotional issue. Uh, and I, I, I do, while it's not, you know, a guarantee, I do agree that the likelihood of this, you know, road continuing is probably very slim, um, and I, that's why I'll point to the unique circumstances in this. So my, my long-worded statement is I would, my opinion at this point is that we stick with the current landscape plan as it exists in front of the planning board in our original package and not the modified plan. And we could reflect the, we can reflect the conditions to, to, to state that. I agree with Paul, but I also agree with Paul that the abutters have to be completely aware, just as Paul said, that those trees could disappear like that and the buffer's gone. The placement of those trees, where they are in the original plan, I think is the best possible resolution for everybody because you have been using, abutters have been using that property, but it does serve to continue the fallacy of a bigger lot than you have. And that is a concern of mine. Um, but I do think putting the trees there preserves the neighborhood in a way that um, seems to satisfy everybody. So I agree. Can we have a motion, please? All right. Uh, the, the staff. What's that? Give it a staff. <laughs> we go through the findings of fact first. Uh, Kenneth Ray is requesting a private access way permit to create one lot located behind 1151 Shore Road with access on the Paper Street recorded as Thompson Road, which requires review under Section 19-7-9 Private Access Way Standards. Two, the town engineer has recommended changes to the plans. Three, Section 979 requires that a maintenance agreement be signed and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. Four, Thompson Road is a paper street where access rights are held by the subdivision lot owners and the town of Cape Elizabeth. Five, the building envelope abuts an RP2. The planning board's experience is that wetlands immediately adjacent to lots or building envelopes are altered without establishment and maintenance of a natural buffer. Six, the application substantially complies with the standards of section 1979 private access, access way standards. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Kenneth Ray for private access way permit to create one lot located behind 1151 Shore Road with access on the paper street recorded as Thompson Road be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the plans be revised for the town engineer's comments in his letter dated May 5th of 07. That a signed maintenance agreement be submitted to the town planner. That note nine on drawing one be amended to read that the applicant will be responsible for removing the structures located within the Thompson Road right-of-way prior to the issuance of a building permit for Lot 2. A copy of this approval shall be mailed by the town planner to the property owners located at 9 and 15 Beast Bluff Terrace in the event they wish to make alternate arrangements. That the plantings proposed and be shown, uh, be as shown on the landscape plan dated you know, March 3rd of this year. Five, that the building envelope be amended to create a 25 foot buffer for the RP2 wetland and that there be no alteration, including removal of vegetation or, or organic matter of the area within 25 feet of the wetland. 
six, that there be no issuance of a building permit nor recording of the plan until the plans have been revised to address the above conditions and submitted to the town planner for review. That's it. I'd like to amend one thing. Yep. Uh, we would have to say under um, that the plans be revised for the town engineer's comments in his letter dated 5707 uh, with the exception uh, with the elimination of number seven because that speaks it to the plantings. Okay. So probably one other one other modification that we would we would need to modify uh, um, note number five to also identify that uh, markings identifying the buffer around the wetland yes, be true. done by the applicant to the approval of the town plan. Yep. The town plan. Markings that's of the right. wetlands. Would you say that again so Haromi gets it right? That the 25-foot uh, buffer around the RP2 wetland be marked uh, by the applicant uh, in, a, in a manner that is approved by the town planner. Any other corrections? Okay, we have a second to the amended. I'll second. Or do we, or I guess we have to have a friendly amendment. Pardon? Friendly amendment. Friendly amendments. Friendly amendments. Right. Friendly. We're good. Friendly amendments, you just accept. Yeah, okay, we're good. Okay. Um, can I get the wording on number four again, please? That the plantings proposed be as shown. Tell me when you're ready. Ready? Be as shown on the landscape plan dated March 3rd of this year, of 07. Yes, I'm sorry, March 2nd. March 2nd. Okay, we have a motion yep. and a, Beth, did you second it? I did. Okay, everybody in favor? I, right here. I have a landscape plan. It says March 2nd. March 2nd, 2000. Should that be the date? Yeah. The, one that, the one that you stamped on? Madam, Madam Chair, we'll change that so that the plans are, are stamped by the town April 30th. 2007. But will future copies of this plan, they may not have that, that stamp necessarily. I mean, what's on the title box? She, 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 in the town she's got it. Yep. Right. Made, seconded. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? So moved. I would like to um, say that I think has been most cooperative and I think the abutters have also been most cooperative mm -hmm. and I think this is the way that it may not be to everybody's satisfaction remember we started with three lots and I think everybody understood the difficulty of that so I'd like to compliment everybody I'm really working together and I hope that you will all continue to work together to make this a happy and acceptable project Thank you, so, Madam Chair. Thank I, you all very much. Thank you. I, I second you on that and the abutters too. It's been it's been a good working process. Thank you. Does she, does she want my copy? She's got a copy, right? Yeah? Yeah, I think that was, I think that's her file copy. Uh-oh. Thank you so much. All right, we have another project here. No.
Great. We have um, Diane Moskowitz and Scott McMullen requesting an after-the-fact resource protection permit. Would you please come to the podium and present the project. Yes, good evening. My name is Albert Frick. I'm here on behalf of uh, Scott McMullen and Diane Maskowitz, who reside at 221 Fickett Road. And this is for a resource protection permit uh, after the fact. Uh, the property is at the uh, corner of Fickett Street and Young Lane. And uh, the, the first plan, which is in your packet, is uh, the plan that was submitted originally for the subdivision. It, it comes from a Sebago Technics 1998 plan submitted in behalf of uh, Fitzpatrick Associates that shows the original wetlands on the site. The, uh, the rear wetland ha has not been affected at all. That, that remains intact. This front wetland, which is a, uh, a wetland swale, it was, it's uh, shallow to bedrock lime and tundrage soils that surround this, this landform. And in the middle here was Naskag, Brayton, glacial till soils, hydric soils, wetlands. And this unit here had been filled, which uh, quantifies the 4,191 square feet of wetland area. Uh, there's an existing pond in this area, and part of that existing pond, 1,398 square feet, is in, in what was an, an upland area, which is now ponded. So the, the impact to the wetland was 4,191 square feet. However, if you consider uh, the mitigation, it's 3,793 square feet. This area is the drainage set. It's all internally drained to this uh, wetland area. The, the drainage shed that uh, feeds this wetland is, uh, is approximately 25,000 square feet. Uh, there there's one, one outlet that it exists at this location, uh, which appears to be ineffective. It's, it's at a high elevation. There's no evidence that there's ever been any um, overflow. It actually discharges to the um, bedrock outcropping on top of Fickett Street area. So for all practical purposes, this area is internally drained to the pond itself. And the post-development plan that exists today is the existing dwelling and driveway. This wetland is intact and has not been touched. The pond exists in this location. And uh, we're asking for an after-the-fact permit, resource protection permit, for the impact of 4,191 square feet. We need to take up the uh, discussion of completeness. Oh. First of all, does anybody have any questions for Mr. Frick before we start this? Or okay, I think we we need to make clear in the in the record that the applicants have attested that they did not alter this wetland in any way, that they bought the property, and the, the alteration had occurred prior to their knowledge and ownership. So that probably should be made a matter of record. But is there anything now before we discuss the matter of completeness? Okay, do we have a motion to entertain them? Motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Diane Maskowitz and Scott McMullen for an after-the-fact resource protection permit 
fill 4,191 square feet of wetland and pond for landscaping located at 221 Fickett Street be deemed complete. All in favor? Um, <coughs> wanna, are there any questions? Be, well, we need to finish the motion too. Are there any questions particularly at this point? Paul, do you want to? Be it further, further order that the above application be tabled to the regular June 19, 2007 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing will be held. A second. Um, maybe we would need to talk about whether or not we need a, a site walk of the property, or is everybody feeling pretty comfortable with? There's only been the one item of correspondence, Maureen, is that correct? Well, there's one item. There's now something from the Conservation, Conservation. Commission. Yeah. yeah. The, one I, the one correspondence was very much in favor of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. leaving things as they are. Maureen, has the applicant received a copy of this memo from the Conservation yes. Commission? I, I don't. I don't need a sidewalk. Yeah, I don't need a sidewalk either. Everybody agree that we don't need a sidewalk. Two yeah. people have said that we don't need a sidewalk. Anybody feel like we need one? Okay. All right, is there anything else then at this point, or we'll just see you next time? Anybody? No? No. Okay. Would the applicant like to say something before we wait till next time? Please come to the podium. Um, I guess uh, I speak mostly because this has been an inconvenience for us for quite a while. And oh, do you want to give your name, please? I'm sorry. My name is Scott McMullen. Thank you. And um, as was mentioned, we really had no involvement mm -hmm. in any of this. And uh, I guess it was our hope that the board, if there were no objections and if there were no uh, adverse reaction from the public, would be able to draw a conclusion on this tonight, as opposed to waiting for another meeting. So that would be our request. Thank you. Um, Madam Chairman, do you know whether the applicant has received a copy of this memorandum from the Conservation Commission? <clears throat> Beg your pardon? Maureen, can you give us a little background behind this Conservation Commission Conservation Commission memo? Um, the commission met Tuesday night. It is their practice at their meetings to go over the planning board agenda with focus on the items that require resource protection permits or where there is open space to be donated. Um, under the zoning ordinance, the, planning, the Conservation Commission is actually specifically referred to that they shall provide advice to the planning board, um, and then the planning board does what they want with that advice. Um, the Conservation Commission was made aware that this was not something that the current applicants had um, done. Uh, they felt uh, very strongly that, as, as the memo states, uh, they, they look at every single application. There are definitely people on the Conservation Commission who would like to see no alteration of wetlands at all, ever. And then there's uh, the majority of them who say, you know, the ordinance allows certain types of wetland alterations, and as long as it's being done in a responsible manner, as long as you're minimizing the impact as much as possible, not creating erosion control problems, that we should recognize the ordinance allows that, and that some wetland alterations are, um, are appropriate. 
Uh, they were, however, very upset with this particular application for a couple of reasons. I think they were very concerned that um, the integrity of the resource protection permit process would be compromised by recognizing something as an after-the-fact permit that probably would not have been granted a permit if they had applied in a timely manner. Uh, it was pointed out to them that the current applicants had nothing to do with this. They still felt very strongly that this would create an incentive for people to uh, disregard the wetlands regulations, to go ahead and make alterations, and then come in after the fact. Uh, one of the uh, Conservation Commission members is an attorney. He pointed out that uh, he felt very strongly that just because it's a prior owner, if that's an issue that should be dealt with between the current owner and the prior owner, and it, it's not something that should be considered when applying the resource protection permit standards. Lorinda, just for my own edification, I... I'd be happy to ask the Conservation Commission to appear at your public hearing next month so they can speak to this personally. Um, I'm not quite sure how to interpret the last point they made. The fact to be resolved in the present and past owner, perhaps when it lives out of state, I guess. What, you know, we're talking about some kind of a, a lawsuit to have the past owner responsible for remedi remediating uh, wetlands. Not an attorney. Or, I mean, that's very ambiguous. It's very strong, but also. Well, but I think there, I mean, the, the, the point that's been made is that you know, the alteration, there's been more, there has been more emphasis put on the fact that the alteration was not an active action of the current applicant than whether or not the, the alteration is appropriate. And they were, I think, very concerned with that. If that really is a key issue, that the, the alteration was done by a prior owner, then that's a civil matter between the current owner and the prior owner. They want to focus on whether or not the alteration was appropriate, whether or not it meets the standards. What's, what would be their solution? Go back and tear it up the way it was, put it back the way it was? Uh, they did ask if there were other options. I, I did note for them, I was told by the code enforcement officer that there have been occasions when the zoning board has been presented with after the fact situations where they were not able to grant a variance because it did not meet the standards. And the option in that case is to apply to the town council for a consent agreement, which is basically an agreement by the town to agree not to enforce. It's a much more serious step. I, I guess I am sympathetic to what the Constitution Commission is saying in terms of being a bad precedent set and uh, someone can violate it and ask for forgiveness later on. That's the case for the precedent that would be set. On the other hand, I also feel empathetic with the current owner who had nothing to do with the violation. Maureen, I haven't, um, I haven't done my research on this particular question that I'm going to ask you, so I admit that right up front. How serious was the initial violation, the initial fill-in of the wetlands, was it? I'm going to say they basically filled half of the existing pond. Okay. And could they have filled any of it? I mean, it, it's... No. No, okay. No. The, the, the town would not allow them. No, you, you, I mean, without getting a permit, you, you really should have left the whole thing alone. Right. There should have been no alteration whatsoever. There should have been a permit request. Um, I, I would put to you, if someone today were to come to you and say, I want to fill half of the pond in my backyard because I want to make my yard more beautiful and I want to landscape it, you know, what standards would you apply? What kind of comments do you think you would be getting from the Conservation Commission? And, and I think that's the point that they were making. Yeah. That's, that's how this ought to be approached. Well, in fact, we had a workshop. We had someone else who had some interest in us doing after the fact approval. Part of the um, alteration was done by a prior owner, part of it was done by the current owner. 
I think we all had a lot of concerns about even that. Well, it sounds to me as though, and I'm, I commiserate with you, but that maybe we need to go ahead and have a public hearing because someone from the Conservation Commission well may want to come and speak, and they are residents of our town. And I'm afraid we're going to just have to table it. I think. Everybody else agree? Yes. yes. Yeah. Sorry. I feel really bad for you. Okay. Anybody else have anything they want to say at this point about? Well, I, I would say, I, as much as I find it discomforting, I think the Conservation Commission voice has a, should have a major say in this kind of situation. We're talking about. Uh, Conservation of wetlands here. So I, I think it's, it's a final decision by the planning board, but we should listen very closely to what the Conservation Commission says. I do think that gives us another perspective to look at this issue within. As Maureen just stated, if this were an application for a permit to fill in half the pond, what would our what would our analysis be? I mean, that certainly gives me cause to pause and rethink how we would treat it. Everybody will have a month to pause and pause think and, and read this. Right. And, um, I'm sure you're welcome to call the Conservation Commission members and talk to them too. I mean, they, they're volunteers who serve in the town, but I think we need to wait and see if there's any. If, I guess maybe there's a question then whether we should have a site walk between now and then. Mm -hmm. I think we should. I don't disagree with you. I yeah, I'd be able right. to that. Okay. All right, so why doesn't everybody get their calendar out as well as you when you think we can come? This group likes to come at the crack of dawn, except for me. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have to be the crack. It could be a little later. Zero dark third. All right. Why don't, why don't the rest of you pick? Because um, I know you, you're all working. So it can be flexible. 7 a.m.? No. <laughs> that flexible. That's just not fair. Now, which day would you like to go? I mean, which day is good for you for us to trump through? Is it late in the day that's good, or um, early, or yeah, probably later, later in the day? Okay. So, what day is good? And we'll see if we can all. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Wednesday or Thursday. Wednesday or Thursday. Um, Thursday, I have Wednesday. I can't do it next Wednesday. I could do it next Thursday, but. Let's do it next Thursday. The twenty-fourth is that good for you? Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. Let me think a minute. I'm trying to think. What do I have on Thursday night? I would not be available. I would not be available. Oh, okay. So that's not a good night. All next week I'm not available. How about this week? This um, is the 17th? Yeah. I would not be available. I'm not available. Not available. I'm not a Weeknights, I, I'll just be blunt, weeknights are pretty much full for me yeah. through the oh. week. Yep. The only, the only windows that I see, at least for me, are, are going to be Saturday mornings. 7 o'clock Saturday. You're just brutal. You need to get off your cell phone, Is Saturday morning a problem for you? We will not. We will not be here this weekend. June 9th is working. That's too late for the next. Or is that, is that a problem? I won't be here then, but that's. <coughs> oh, okay. So it doesn't matter. Okay. June 9th, is that a good Saturday? It's my 50th birthday. I expect a birthday donut. We'll be there. We're there early. We'll okay. Be. What what time is convenient for you? Saturday. Is that what it is? Saturday yes. morning, the ninth. You said. Ten o'clock. Hmm? Ten o'clock. That That'll work for me. That'll work for me. Paul, is that too late for Little League? Are you guys still in Little League then? We're still in Little League. Okay, Maureen but can't make it then. Ten o'clock. That that fits my Little League schedule. Is that okay? Ten o'clock on the ninth. Is it really? Yeah. Okay. okay. Too late. Yet. Walk and pick it. I think. Um, <clears throat> and we and we have to sing happy birthday too. <laughs> Loudly, because it's a big birthday. It has a zero in it. I so. know it is a big birthday. Donut with a candle. 
Okay, 10 o'clock on the 9th, Saturday, the 9th of June. Your house on second. Would, would, would the town right, thank you. be so kind to send a reminder email? Yes, yes okay. please. <laughs> all right. So I guess that's, that's all. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we have one more item on the agenda. Um, right, the last item on the agenda is the Troutbrook Watershed <coughs> Resolution, which everybody received, everybody received a copy of it. And I think all we have to do is, is vote on whether or not we'd like to we approve the resolution the way it is and hope that the two town councils get together and come up with a committee or something. <laughs> yeah, what I received in the package was a one page and it ended in the end. Yeah, I thought it was. Oh, here, you can read the last paragraph. you want to read the last paragraph? I think I read the quote, but I'd like to look at it again. Yeah. Okay, it came by email, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so I think I got it that way too. Okay, everybody, does anybody else not have the second page? No. I don't either. Do you have the second page? I don't have it. Here, read mine. Or <laughs> we, we vote. How do we vote about this power? Mm -hmm. Just Just somebody um, a motion to approve the resolution as written. I uh, I move that we approve the joint resolution by the planning boards of Elizabeth and South Florida. Second? Second. All in favor? Unanimous. There we go. Excellent. Somebody want to move to adjourn? Madam Chair, I'd move to adjourn. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. We're adjourned.